Hey, how many people are you expecting? Relax, it's an open invite. I think you're a few seats short. Yeah, like four team seats. You should enter your eligible New York lottery draw game tickets with Collect and Win. You could win a $5,000 gift card to use at the Home Depot and buy a bigger table to host. Hopefully they also sell chairs. The Home Depot is not a sponsor of this promotion. You must be 18 years or older to purchase a lottery ticket. You must be 21 or older to purchase a quick draw ticket where alcoholic beverages are served. Please play responsibly. Enter by 1720. Hey, how many people are you expecting? Relax, it's an open invite. I think you're a few seats short. Yeah, like four team seats. You should enter your eligible New York lottery draw game tickets with Collect and Win. You could win a $5,000 gift card to use at the Home Depot and buy a bigger table to host. Hopefully they also sell chairs. The Home Depot is not a sponsor of this promotion. You must be 18 years or older to purchase a lottery ticket. You must be 21 or older to purchase a quick draw ticket where alcoholic beverages are served. Please play responsibly. Enter by 1720. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 368. Collect moments, not things. Palo Coelho. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films. From predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them, the odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur Method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. Today's show is also sponsored by the Newport Beach Film Festival. The Newport Beach Film Festival invites you to Orange County, California, where the past attendance of the festival was over 58,000 film geeks, enthusiasts, and cinephiles during a week-long festival that runs from April 23rd to the 30th. The submission deadline is December 20th, and you can submit through Film Freeway or at NewportBeachFilmFest.com. Now, guys, today on the show, we are going to go minimalist. We are actually going to become minimalistic filmmakers, and I'm going to talk to arguably one of the leading minimalist filmmakers out there, Matt Delavella. And Matt runs a YouTube channel that has 2.15 million subscribers And he talks about minimalism, filmmaking, and creativity. Now, I had the pleasure of being on Matt's show uh, years ago when he was first starting out, when he was just a young podcaster growing up and uh, building up his audience. And then uh, all of a sudden, I turned around one day and I'm like, Matt, what the hell happened? You got like millions of followers now. It was insane. And I wanted to bring, you know, it was first of all, I was honored to be on his show uh, even back then when he was first starting out, because I love his message. He was uh, the director of a movie called Minimalism, which was all over Netflix and all over online. And and I loved it. And I've tried to bring more minimalism into my life. Not easy with, you know, with a family and kids and things like that. But I've really made an attempt to kind of get rid of and declutter my life. And that's why I love the quote that I use this morning is to collect moments and experiences, not things. And we're going to talk about not only about minimalism, but we're also going to talk about how he markets, how he's been able to build a two over 2 million uh, subscriber base on YouTube, how he monetizes, what he does, how he, this is his full-time business at this point. So uh, how he uses Patreon uh, and other avenues to market his, his channel and build out a minimalist empire. By using the film entrepreneurial method, of course, whether he knows it or not, he's using the film entrepreneurial method. So I, I want to talk to him a little bit 
about how he does what he does and also how he got distribution and he sold his movie minimalism and how he was able to leverage that into the next stage of his life. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Matt Diavella. I'd like to welcome to the show, Matt Diavella, man. Thank you so much for being on the show, brother. Alex, thanks for having me, dude. Excited to connect with you again, man. It's been a little while. Yeah, man. It has been, it's been a minute. I mean, when you, when I first, uh, you, when you had me on your podcast, in 26, 17, 16? Probably, t- ooh, probably 2017, very early on in yeah, the year. Ver- right, exactly. I, w- I came to your, uh, to, your, to your house and we, we recorded, uh, it's, by the way, it's still one of the best interviews I've had and I've abused that video everywhere, as you've noticed. Uh, I love wow, that thanks, interview. It was, it was great. It was a great interview. And, uh, and you had just literally gotten off the boat from New York, like you'd like fresh off the boat. Yeah, that was a, a fresh start for my, my now wife and I. We, you know, it was mostly a personal decision. It wasn't let's move out to LA to be closer to the film industry. I had an established freelance career at that time, and uh, I, I was moving into doing more original content. For us, it was more so uh, my wife's from Sydney, Australia. So to be able to visit family, you know, it's sure. a 23 hour flight from New York is kind of rough. So uh, we got the direct flight from L.A., and it's a lot easier now to see family. But uh, that said, it's certainly been great just to be in L.A. There's so many creative people that I've gotten the chance to connect with. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it definitely rivals New York in terms of uh, the creative energy for sure. Yeah, without I just literally got back from New York. I was visiting there on vacation, and it is such a different energy, man. Oh, my God. Yeah. It is <laughs> so – I was right in the middle of Midtown. Oh God! I was staying in Midtown for like for like four or five days. I was just like, it'll get to you after a little while for sure. It just like like you know you walk out at like seven a.m. to go to Gregory's to pick up some coffee, and all of a sudden you're just like, boom! Like, is it noon? Is like, what is going on? There is so much action going on. Like that's yeah. the, the city does not sleep. While well, L.A. is just chilled, much more. Right. Chilled. Well, we lived in West Hollywood, so it was a little bit busier, but definitely not close to New York. And then recently, three months ago, we moved to closer to the beach. So now we're really living oh. the LA life and it's, uh, <laughs> it's very chill. I mean, it's it, there's not as much chaos. So for mm-hmm. us, we're finding some some stillness and quiet here, which has been great. And I'm in the valley. So, you know, we're, we're nice and quiet over here as well. For sure. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, first of all, man, how did you get into the business? So filmmaking was the, I would say, the only subject in school, in high school, that I really excelled at, that you didn't have to force me to do. Uh, You know, I I would be working in study hall hours, during lunch hours, after school. I was always working on videos and films. And I was very lucky to have a a great production school uh, classes. There's probably three or four even advanced editing and, and film classes in my high school. Shout out to Mr. Brandt. Uh, Voorhees High School, like yeah. he did an amazing job. He had all we had all the you know Mac computers. We had Final Cut Pro. I don't know if it was Final Cut Pro five or whatever it was mm-hmm. at the time. But I graduated high school in two thousand six, so before the whole DSLR movement and revolution. And so we were shooting on these like you know crappy handy cams and DV tapes. But that's where I started. That's where I fell in love with filmmaking, and that's where. I realized that this was, if anything, going to be my future and a potential career path uh, moving forward. And at that time, you know, 2006, YouTube is starting to to build up. We're starting to see more alternative media versus Mm -hmm. the traditional Hollywood studio system. And I think just seeing that, seeing YouTubers get famous, seeing videos go viral, just allowed me to see the potential in, in what it could be and what I could do with film. So that's like when I would say I got started. It wasn't probably for another four to four or five years before I ever made a dime doing it. Nice. Now, where I first saw you was uh, the documentary Minimalism because I was mm-hmm. just scanning through Netflix. I was like, ooh, minimalism. I want to be a minimalist. Yes, I have too much crap in my life. I <laughs> right. need to watch this documentary. And I watched it and I loved the documentary. And, and that's when, when you're, I think, I forgot who connected us. It was a mutual friend who connected. Yeah, Matt Webb. Matt Webb, yes, yes, Matt. Matt connected us. And he's like, hey, do you know the guys who made minimal? I'm like, I don't. I would love to be on his podcast. I think that would be awesome to talk minimalism. Um, 
and, and that, was yeah, that was very that was very kind of you to come on the show because <laughs> I had probably fifty downloads an episode at the time, and uh, <laughs> it was definitely one of my favorite episodes early on. That uh, you know you brought it, you you just you have so much experience both in like oh, the industry so and also in the independent stuff. So I learned a lot, and you helped me create a bunch of really great uh, little teasers that we got to share around on Instagram. Oh, which was always helpful, dude. It was my absolute pleasure, and now the the, the um. The uh, foot is on on the other shoe, as they say, because you now have a <laughs> massive audience, which we will talk about later. Uh, but let's get back into minimalism. So, um, uh, tell me about minimalism. How did it come about? And and first of all, what is the definition of minimalism by itself? And then we'll get into the movie. Yeah, so minimalism is a lifestyle that helps us figure out what's most important in life. It often starts with the things, the stuff that that you know. Of course, most American homes have a lot of clutter we've got attics and basements and sheds filled with stuff i certainly Sto- storage, know storage storage companies like that's massive <laughs> it's a multi-billion dollar industry right it's like ridiculous. We, and our houses are what like 30 50 times bigger than they were in the 40s and now we have storage so much stuff that we need to throw them in storage lockers so i think minimalism address that problem in a big way for a lot of people. And it started with decluttering and like, let's just clear out the stuff that we don't value, don't care about, don't look at, don't notice anymore. uh, And just curate a set of things that we really love and we really value and we want to take care of and focus on. But then of course, by getting rid of this stuff, it, it also allows us much more time to focus on the important things, what we want to get out of life asking some deeper questions about where we want to take our lives, what do we want to do, who are the people that we want to spend our time with. So I think that was probably the biggest thing for me when it came to minimalism. And I probably, it was just after I graduated college that I found out about it for myself. Of course, it's not a new idea, but there's this resurgence of the idea, many more people talking about it now. And minimalism helped me to just redefine what my idea of success was. Uh, both as a filmmaker, as a creative, mm-hmm. you know, monetarily, I just thought I had to get to a certain place in order to be happy. I needed to have all the stuff. Right. I needed to have a nice car. I needed to have a really nice house, uh, and, and all these things, the tech gadgets that I thought I needed to be successful and to feel successful. And then I just realized that uh, after discovering it, that I had enough to be content. I had enough to be happy with where my life was at. Sure, I, I was still ambitious and I still wanted to make films and I wanted to be driven creatively. And, I, you know, I still had these things that I wanted to accomplish in my life, but I wasn't letting that get in the way of my happiness. I, I was able to take a step back and actually enjoy the journey and the process. And not to say that it was a light bulb flash instant, everything was perfect. And I was content from that moment on because life gets in the way. We certainly have our struggles and that's part of life. But it's given me greater awareness and acceptance uh, for the life I'm living and, and a much more appreciation for what I have and what I had. And then you decided to make a whole documentary about it. Yeah, so that came about. I had been freelancing for probably seven or eight years, and I had been making pretty good money, paying down my student loans, which I had <laughs> over $98,000. Oh, worth. my God, dude. We, can, yeah. we, can we just stop for a second? Can we just talk about it's student a, debt, dude? Please. It's a problem. It's for filmmakers specifically. And I know a lot of – I know a lot of people I, before uh, I'm going to be actually speaking to someone uh, in the future uh, or in the past, depending on when this gets released, that right. that uh, was able to pay off their entire 40 or 50 thousand dollars student debt in 11 months. And they and they, wow. and they and they and they tell you exactly how they did it. And he, I'm like, yes, we need to talk about it. I think it's if anyone's listening to this and you want to be a filmmaker, would you advise putting ninety eight thousand dollars in debt? To become a filmmaker? No, and, and the world has changed a lot since that time. Now there's right. a lot more opportunities to create on your own. So what I would probably suggest is there are so many alternatives, especially oh. for the first two years of college. So whether you're taking community kept classes, online college, whatever it is, uh, I could have significantly reduced the amount of debt and given myself some time to breathe uh, to, to find my path. But like, dude, most of the stuff I learned in terms of filmmaking wasn't from sitting down in a class. It was from, and by the way, I was a broadcast telecommunications major, so it was more so TV, but it was me 
grabbing a camera, like as cheap as it was and as bad as the quality was at the time, and just running out, filming, doing a bunch of stuff, editing on my laptop, and just making films. That's how I got really good, and that's how I started to see myself uh, distance myself from those that were in my class. There mm-hmm. were a lot of people in my class that were just waiting for the syllabus and for the instructor to tell them how to be a filmmaker, how to make a great video. <laughs> and I was just running out, just experimenting, trying different things because I really loved it. Like you couldn't, you couldn't force me not to do it. So uh, I think that's one of the things that you have to learn is that like the piece of paper nowadays, especially when it comes to creativity and filmmaking, it's 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 it's, you know, it's not going to be as necessary as you think. Like if I'm going to hire somebody. I'm looking at their work and yeah. I'm getting to know them and understanding if they're going to mesh well with myself and the people I work with. Uh, but at the end of the day, like I don't need um, that piece of paper to, to legitimize your value. Without question. I even heard that now Google is taking kids right out of high school. They won't even look at people with college yeah, degrees it. because they're just like, no, we'd rather take someone clean and train them for exactly how we want them. Yeah. And if they have the skills, that's it. It's, it's, I've always told people like, look, if you can, if you can do it, if, if you don't have to worry about money, sure, go to film school. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. It's a sure. nice four yeah. years. You, you'll, you'll meet some people. It'll be great. But if not, man, I mean, I walked out with about 18 to $20,000 in debt and I was able to pay that off luckily within a few years after I got out. But, $98,000. That's like obscene amount of money, you know? Yeah. And that's around the time when I discovered minimalism and, you know, I was living in my parents' basement just after college, had $98,000 in debt, the Ugh. smartest thing I could think of, which was to buy a brand new car. So now I'm like $118,000 <laughs> in debt. I'm just buried and I feel like a failure. I'm like, what is going on? Like, what have I done with my life? All my yeah. friends were going out and getting their starting jobs and starting salaries. Right. And then uh, minimalism helped me to take a step back and, and kind of redefine that idea of success like we mm-hmm. talked about. And also it, it gave me a drive, a deep drive to want to be debt free, to, to have that freedom of being able to move where I wanted to, take the jobs that I wanted to. You know, a lot of times it's very easy to just focus on filmmaking or that creative pursuit that you have when our lives should be taken into account and and how flexible we we are, how little debt we have that determines what jobs we can take in the future Mm -hmm. and really our career path in general. So like it it all matters. So for me, like paying off uh, my debt, it it took me about four and a half years, um, which was uh, just basically every, every dollar I made. And as I grew my bit, like my business did pretty well. I grew my business doing wet. I did, 50, 60 weddings probably over the years, bar mitzvah videos, and they had to get my hands on, started working with tech companies, and I would just pile up money, but I didn't see it as my money. I never did. I was like, I'm in debt. This money isn't mine. It belongs to the bank. And that separation for me allowed me to not get attached to the money and not feel like, oh my God, like I'm losing something because all I saw was I was gaining freedom by paying off my debt. Oh, it's a great way to look at it. Great way to look at it. I just wanted to talk about that because it's something that does not yeah. talk. It's 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 a complete. It's it's a it's a crisis, man. It's a crisis because I, I anytime I hear a filmmaker tell me like, oh yeah, I got a hundred grand of debt and I just got out, and I'm like, I just it just it hurts me because I know yes. as well as you do, it will take years years for them to pay that back if they're good. Like it took you what four years and you were yeah. hustling. To try yeah. to get it off, you were like focused on it. But if like if you don't, it could take decades. It's like literally walking out with a mortgage of a of you know of a house that you never get and, to touch. And, and you're going to end up paying way more. So if you're the person that's like, ah, forget about it. It's not even a big problem. Like oh, I'll interest pay only minimum. Yeah, for, yeah interest dude, only. You're going to end up yeah. You're going to end up paying like an addition. Like if you have a hundred grand in debt, you might end up paying 150, 175 in twenty to thirty years total. So, I mean, it's, it's the the smartest thing you could do financially is to, to wipe out your debt and have a clean record. It's all about ROI, man. What's the return on the investment? Is it worth it? Is it worth it or not? All right. So back to your documentary. So you, so you got into minimalism and then you started, you put this documentary together. How did it come about? So I was working freelance. I had set like a little corny bucket list. I had about 20 items on it from like fall in love with somebody who doesn't speak English and like a bunch of silly. That's awesome. But then at the top of the list was make a documentary about something I care about. And minimalism was something that had already impacted my life. So that was kind of in the back of my mind. 
And then I happened to meet these guys, Josh and Ryan, who run a website called The Minimalists. Uh, they've got an amazing podcast under the same name. And uh, I, I basically offered to help them out. Like they were coming to New York. They needed somebody to shoot a video for them. So I said, hey, your guys' work has impacted me greatly. And I would love to somehow uh, give back, help out, uh, shoot a video for you. Like whatever you'd be willing to charge me, I'd be happy to take it. And that, like again, that's from this fact that I was doing pretty well financially. So I wasn't struggling. I just wanted to work on projects I was passionate about. So a lot of times it's like you, if you're in that position cornered against the wall and you need to make money, you, you may not be able to do something like that because maybe they, they, uh, they wouldn't be willing to pay you your rate. Uh, but anyway, we ended up working together. The video that we, videos we put together ended up being, they really enjoyed them. I thought it turned out great. And we just built a relationship and got to know each other. And then probably three months later, Josh gave me a call uh, and he's like, hey, like, what do you think about making a documentary uh, about minimalism? And his initial idea was to just do a, a tour documentary. So pretty basic, like just follow us around on tour and then it'll just be about us, uh, you know, talking about our book and talking about minimalism. And maybe we can make this like 45 minute piece that we can release to our audience. That was kind of the, the, the gist of it. But I was thinking a little bit bigger picture and I was like, well, you know, this is a massive, or at least in my eyes was a massive movement. It was pretty small at the time, but there was still like, you know, tens of thousands of people that were focused and practicing this thing called minimalism. There were blogs that were getting uh, just as many views and, and, and hits. So I knew it was an idea that was resonating. And I was like, this, like, I, there's really something here. If we interview all these people who are minimalists, if we maybe find some experts to talk to, to help us talk about consumerism, our culture, the American dream, maybe we can understand how we got here. So it started with the tour, like, let's just go out on tour. Let's just film you guys uh, as you continue to spread and talk about this message of minimalism. And then let's interview people along the way and see what we can put together. There was some planning in the beginning, but like Mike Tyson says, everybody's got a plan until you get punched this in the, the jaw and the face. And that certainly happened with me. We, I mean, you know, I had this beautiful vision of how these scenes would be laid out, how every interview would be shot in the same exact way. And then when you get there and it's just you, you do the best you can with each situation, each environment you're put into. Right. And uh, so we filmed a ton and then took a step back and said, okay, like, what do we have here? We started editing together, rough cut one, two, three, filming more footage. It was probably a process of two to three years uh, from the very conception of the idea to the time we finally had our, our like, theatrical release and debut and we, we ended up uh, promoting thing and releasing it online. Uh, but it definitely, like at least in how it was received, was well beyond all of our expectations because it was just me shooting and editing 95% of it. I had some people and friends help out along the way and I had a friend color grade it for cheap. I had uh, somebody else that I found, Peter Duff. He did the sound mix for cheap. And uh, so we were able to really make it work. Uh, but we didn't think it was going to be like a hit. We didn't think anybody was going to really watch it because a lot of documentaries go to Netflix to die. They can at least. You know, there's hundreds and hundreds of documentaries, on, probably thousands of documentaries on there. So we didn't have expectations that it was going to do well. Uh, we were just... We just wanted to hopefully make our money back, but really make a film that we cared about and could help some people. But so, but the thing I, uh, that I find fascinating, and I always kind of preach this as well, is as you guys, or at least you were thinking about this more than the, than the boys were, that there was a niche audience here. There, there was mm -hmm. a niche audience that was growing. It was in, in it was as about the hockey stick up as far as the, the trajectory of the minimalist, because now minimalism is it's a lot more mainstream than it was. Yeah. When so, you guys yeah, were starting. You, totally. You're always going to have uncertainty, I think. Like, mm -hmm. you, you're never going to be like, yo, totally. Like, there's definitely going to be people who buy this film. No. But we had a great, I mean, we probably ended up spending around $50,000 on the film totally, maybe seventy. You know, that's like after color sound. We had a original music score, which probably mm -hmm. cost the most. Uh, which helped us in terms of like, then we didn't have to deal with licensing because licensing right. can be like really tough. All the legal stuff is, is on the uh, challenging to navigate. But uh, yeah, we, like we didn't have any expectations and, but we did know that, Hey, th they have a decent sized audience. I don't know how many people, like whether it was 50 or a hundred thousand people a month that went to their blog, 
But I was like, that's enough, I think, to make our money back. And, uh, and what year was that, by the way? What year was that? Uh, 2016 is when we released it. So at the end of 2016. Right. So, yeah. So, so you, you, so you released it. And how did you distribute the film? You self-distributed it at first? Yeah. So, uh, we, you know, we reached out to Netflix and, and a few other places and we got turned down from all of them, uh, including Netflix. How did you so turn, how we, did you reach out to them? Like how, uh, just out uh, of curiosity. I, I, that was one of the great things about just having a team is that like I worked on the film and the making of it. And then Josh and Ryan from the minimalist, they are the ones that went out, uh, the producers to, to get it sold and to, to figure out the distribution model. But, uh, and I don't know if they had a connection there or maybe they, I think maybe it was through gather, which was the mm-hmm. distributor. Uh, so they did our theatrical release where I think we went to a couple hundred theaters. Um, you know, mistake in hindsight, just because, the theaters, we there was just cuts coming left and right for different people. Theaters get a half a cut, uh, then like distribution company gets half of what's left over, and then by the time at the end of the day, like I think we made like two hundred fifty thousand dollars from the theatrical release, and That's... then pocketed, but po- pocketed probably I don't know five to ten or something each. Oh, so yes, yeah. but you yeah. all right, so, but the movie did you by self distributing it through because gathers kind of like a. Kind of like a tug or something like along those lines, right? Yeah, exactly. They were, the, yeah, they're basically a tug competitor. Right. Um, so yeah, they they certainly helped us out with that. And then we, uh, the, it was cool uh, to to have theater run. I'm not gonna lie. Like I went to one of the screenings in New York, and to see a line wrapped around the block, like 400 people, was mind blowing and terrifying <laughs> at the same time. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you, like you know the experience that yeah. you, you had your premiere at the Chinese theater in West Hollywood, like yeah. just a surreal experience to, to be there, to, to see a film premiered, uh, of your own. But yeah, it was, uh, then we ended up just doing uh, independent. So we just said, all right, we, we did the theatrical release. We can't get it on Netflix or anywhere. Uh, let's put it on Vimeo. So we did Vimeo for a month. I don't know why we did it. They didn't give us any exclusivity deal, but we said, Let's just make it simple for people, which is one place to buy it. Uh, so we released it on Vimeo for a month, and then we put it on iTunes and a bunch of other places. And then it, it ended up going to the top 10 on iTunes. I think it was one of the- yeah, For top 10 of, of documentaries or top 10 of all? I think it was documentary. Okay. It might have been of all. I don't know. It was. I don't know. It was like something. It was. I. I, I have a screenshot of it somewhere. I'd have to like look into it. But I don't. I don't think it was top ten of all movies because that would have been. That would have been nuts. Uh, yeah. But, but it even top ten of well. documentaries is huge. Yeah. So it did very well, and it was. Uh, then I think it was at that point that we reinitiated conversations with Netflix. Be like, hey, it did really well. Like a lot of people are connecting with this film. And then we were able to gather connected with this third uh, party company, Kino Larber, who's a distributor who finally got us onto Netflix. And again, we weren't sure how it was going to do, if it was going to even perform well or people were going to see it. But then just the, I think it was just the right timing, the right idea. And we executed on it well enough that uh, it ended up trending and it, it was certainly seen by way more people than we thought. Were going to see it. Now, was that self-distribution model to get to Netflix, did that make financial sense? I mean, and what was like the experience? Because you're like, you've already named two other people that are taking cuts before Netflix, you know? So like, exactly. so how does that, on a financial standpoint, how did that make, did it make sense? And was it worth it, even if you didn't make a lot of money, just to have the exposure? So you're probably going to make more money from like, uh, the independent releasing, like if your film does well, right. Uh, you're going to, you might get a guarantee from a Netflix or a Hulu, but if the film does really well, you're, you have more upside if you just release it independently financially. Um, that said, if you don't have the audience promote it, if you're not able to push it in that way, Netflix may also be able to get you more leverage and, and connect you with a larger audience. So that's like the balance that you always have to think about. Although I think most filmmakers today would just be stoked to get a film on Netflix. It's a great credit to have. It really, I think, will bolster your resume to be like, I you know, directed a de- documentary on Netflix or made a film for Netflix. Uh, so hard to turn that down, even if financially it wasn't going to be as lucrative as doing something else. But you're also building relationships. So you should never see your career as like a one-off, one hit, just trying to make one movie that pays all of your, the money. Sometimes it works out like that. Sometimes you're Joe Rogan, you do Fear Factor, and then you, you technically don't have to work again for the rest of your life. Right. But for most people, you know, we want to make a career out of this. We want to keep making films. 
So if you get one film on Netflix, then you could potentially have discussions and, and talk with them about creating a follow-up or a new documentary or something else in the future. Uh, and that's definitely something that we've done. That's awesome, man. Now, um, before we get into your YouTube, man, you had a freelance business. Uh, I'm assuming you're not doing as much freelance anymore. I'm not doing any freelance anymore. And it was hard to turn away from because I loved it. Mm -hmm. I love, I love doing client work, especially the further I got along into it because the more selective you can be and the more I was just working with clients I love. As I mentioned, I did weddings and bar mitzvahs and local TV commercials, like anything I could get my hands on to build my skills and expertise. And then as that evolved, I started working with more startups and tech companies. I worked with a company, Envision, a lot, which uh, they're an amazing prototyping design tool. We, they ended up funding a full feature length documentary called Design Disruptors, mm -hmm. which is where we went and we interviewed with Airbnb and Twitter and Facebook and at Google. Uh, the self-driving car division at Google. So like talk about how they design experiences today for consumers and, and people for, uh, that use technology, uh, which is basically everybody. And mm -hmm. so it was like, fun. It was exciting. And I was working on really creative projects and they all had pretty good budgets. So, and I was making good money, but then I released minimalism and I was like, I like this better. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, and it's more challenging and it's going to be way more risky if I drop all client work and go full in on creating original content and like, it truly was a risk. Like I'm talking, I'm making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to making $0 a year. And I didn't make a dime for, it was like a year and a half pursuing YouTube. Um, but that transition was one that I knew I had to make because as much as I love the freelance stuff, as much as I was connected and tied to it, I knew that there was a, a bigger challenge for me to face and I would regret it if I didn't do it. Yeah. And, and same goes for me. I was, you know, I had my, my strive, my thriving post-production business I've had for 20 years. And I, within the last year, year and a half, I stopped. I just said, I'm just not, I've turned, I turned down work now because now I'm doing full-time indie film hustle and film entrepreneur and all the things that I do. With it and it's, it's your time, dude. Like you can't do it all. As much as you would love to have all the time to work, and I know you, dude. You work harder than anybody I know. Uh, so I know just how I'm sure how much you probably push yourself to do both at the same time. It's just uh, too much, man. It's it, a it, tipping point. You gotta you gotta put your family first, and you need to make sure that yeah. you're not sacrificing too much. And very much like you, like you just start figuring out what makes you happy and what and what is your new definition of success and happiness and that took me years to figure out i mean you're a bit younger than i am but uh but we've both figured it out i wish i would have figured it out at your age but i figured it <laughs> out i figured it out at my age and 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 i said you know what i just i don't as i no, i like doing this i like waking up in the morning creating content uh being of service to my community and also go out and get to make my own films write books do other things and it's just so much more satisfying as a human being to do all that and as a creative to do all that than it is just to do client work and and deal with the politics and deal with the i have to chase money or i have to go do this yeah. and all this other stuff it's a so, dream dude i mean it, like it is, is, it like is. Stand -up, it's what stand-up comedians like if like their goal for at least most of them there's obviously a handful of people who just want to be famous just like people who get into youtube right. but like the dream is to make a living doing what you love to make a living making films or doing stand up comedy whatever it is mm -hmm. and making a living is paying the bills period uh, right. and if you can get to that point like i think that's what most people should be striving for and you get you fall into the trap of always wanting more and more and that's where i think you could potentially you're going to hurt your happiness because if you're constantly chasing happiness or chasing uh, this success or whatever it is, that presupposes that you don't have it now and you, you likely never will. Right. So by being content in the moment and like just being grateful for the fact that we can do this for a living, I think is, is that's everything. Yeah, because most filmmakers – I know I did get caught up in the whole I need to – you know, get into the studio system. I need to make big, huge movies. I need to be a millionaire. I need to live in the Hollywood Hills and, and live that lifestyle. And that's the definition, you know, of being a successful filmmaker where that is a definition for some people, but it's okay to make a living making of being a filmmaker or, or doing things in the film industry that is not, you know, shooting at Avengers or avatar you know it's like it's it's okay and, and and you know how many directors get to do that 
literally, like how many studio directors are there? Literally, like, I don't know, a few hundred, you know, that like maybe a thousand guys in the hit, like we're talking about 50, 60 year generation here of filmmakers, like from Scorsese yeah. all the way to Nolan and, and Finch. Like there's not a lot of dudes that get a hundred, two hundred million dollar check. It's just, and, and if you, I mean, uh, I, I don't know each of these people personally, but I certainly know that a lot of these top directors have a lot of stress in their lives. And <laughs> yes. it's, I mean, to be at the top is not something that we all should admire because, you know, if you polled the thousand people who potentially do these big budget films and you ask them all how happy they are and, and how content they are, like, I, I would be surprised if more than 50% of them were like thrilled with their life or their life was in balance. Um, there's a lot of things that we don't see from the outside. And I think if you're constantly trying to, and I could be wrong, but I think mm-hmm. if we're constantly trying to have these extrinsic rewards and these external measures of success, fame, wealth, uh, instead of looking internally about, are we content? Are we happy with what we have? Are we filled with our jobs and our family? Uh, then we're going to be making a big mistake because you know, there's always a, more stuff. You can always have more crap or you can always have a bigger film and, you know, you have a hit film, but what happens if the next film flops and like nobody watches it and then your career is over if you didn't have do those internal and ask those internal questions first, then it's going to be a pretty big fall from the top. Yeah, no question. And, and, and imagine the pressure, man, like you and I have done production. So like, you know, imagine you have, you know, a quarter million dollars on your head as a director producer or a million dollars on your head as a director producer. That's stressful. It's stressful. You know, you have to make your day. You got to deal with the talent that's having an issue because, you know, they had a, a breakup with their boyfriend or girlfriend. And now we have to, and now they're slowing down production. So now you can't get your day. And then the producer's going to be yelling at you. And, and there's all these other things. And let's not even talk about if it's a success or not. That's just making the damn thing, let wow. alone trying to be successful. And that's at a million dollar level. Can you imagine at a 50, 100, $200 million level, there is a few human beings on the planet that really have that capability. Do I mean, will I take the meeting from Marvel? Absolutely. I will take that meeting. I think you would take the meeting. I mean, right? You'd be like, let's go. 100%. Have- you take the meeting. <laughs> you take the meeting, you know? Like, <laughs> you take the meeting. Um, but like, the, you know, I'm sure you know the Duplass brothers, right? They, yeah. they took that meeting with Marvel and they said no. Because mm-hmm. they're like, it's not really what we want to do. And that's a really strong conviction of who they are and what makes them happy. They have that definition very clear where everybody else in Hollywood would kill for that job. A hundred percent. Yeah. I, the ability to say no, I think is a muscle that not enough people work at. Mm-hmm. And uh, Greg McEwen, who wrote the book Essentialism, talks about the myth of success, how you get to the point where you work your whole life to be successful. You finally get it. And then all of a sudden you get all these amazing opportunities, all these other opportunities to say yes to things. So people start taking it and like startups and tech companies fall into this trap. They start trying to do everything they possibly can because now they have the resources and the team to try to go after it. But then they lose sight of what got them success in the first place. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you have to develop that muscle, the ability to say no uh, and, and especially if you're looking for happiness and contentment, if all you're looking for is financial reward and gain, you'll say yes to a bunch of other things. And then, you know, it, it could fall in your face and, and it could end up not working out well for you if you say yes to too much. So you shouldn't do four Transformers movies in a row is what you're telling me. It <laughs> might be stressful. Some gray hairs might end up coming out of your head. Sure. So after the third one, should we have said yes to the first one, Mr. Bay? Should yeah. we just could we have just left that alone and moved on to a bigger, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I love I, Mike. Dude, I, I hear you. <laughs> I love Mike. I, I do. I do. I, I'm, I'm a. I'm actually. I'm a big fan of his first few films. The Rock. I still think is like one of the best action movies ever okay. made. Yeah. So so good. But, I mean, that's the cool thing about like making films too is that like. Yeah, if you're personally happy with the work that you make and like yeah. you, you make a film that you're really proud of. Um, I think like sometimes like that's enough to, to keep you going, to, to, right. to be proud of. Cause like you can't hit, hit do a knock out of the park every single time you make right. a movie yes. and it's going to be ups and downs for sure. And I'm not talking about Michael Bay. <laughs> I was about to say like, yeah, that's all nice and dandy, but when it costs $150 million, 
you kind of have to worry about if it's a hit or not if you want to do you it. You might again. not be making another one if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, so let's get into YouTube, brother, because when I met you, you were doing a podcast, uh, and y- you were kind of playing around in YouTube, but you weren't really deep in yet. I mean, you were. Did you? Did, were you making videos at that point? I think that's a good way to look at it. I was basically following the Joe Rogan method, which is, uh, you know, he's got a YouTube channel and Mm -hmm. he's got his main podcast. And what you see with Joe Rogan is a lot of excerpts from that podcast. So you record this for him, a three hour interview, but I might do an hour, two tops, and then I can cut it up into all these short clips and then I can post it on my YouTube channel. Yeah. So that was like my main but you, were foc- but, but you were focusing on building a YouTube. You're like, I'm going to do something in YouTube. It wasn't like a – oh. it But it was, it was the pod- – the podcast was my main form of content, especially for the first year as I, as I started to make original content. I thought the podcast was the thing that was going to uh, be my bread and butter and be my uh, you know, financial income as well as my creative uh, pursuit. But then mm-hmm. – Basically, I, I did that for a very long time, and I just didn't get any views. And I there was, you know, and I knew that I gave, I was giving myself like two to three years, and I had a runway from my freelance career that I was able to, you know, just dedicate myself at least for a year, maybe two years, uh, and also having a, a wife that supported me financially helped oh, out have, a whole lot. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> Shout out to the wives and the husbands yes, out there absolutely. that are holding things down. Yes, because uh, that definitely it just it's more so peace of mind and like made me feel comfortable in doing it and having her support allowed me to pursue it. But the the podcast it grew a little bit. I was getting a few thousand downloads a month, but it it wasn't at the point where it was financially viable for me. So I was like, all right, how, what can I do now to like just switch things up? And then I just you know, started watching more YouTube videos and just was paying attention to what other people were doing. And then said, Oh, you know what, why don't I do like a minimalist apartment tour? Uh, I think I did, there was a couple of videos I did early on. One was just like traveling simply, like how I remember that travel one. while being yeah. simple. And it was like more, it was really voiceover as well as just vacation footage of uh, a recent trip that I had taken to Hawaii, I believe. And then the next video I did was my minimalist apartment. And then that one, was the first video I made that really took off. So it wasn't just like a cliche like tour. Like, hey guys, it wasn't like MTV Cribs. Welcome to my apartment. This is my stuff. MTV was, Cribs. You've dated yourself, sir. <laughs> yes, I, I certainly have. <laughs> and uh, so in that video, it was like I tried to make it really cinematic. I tried to use all this expertise that I had created over the years to make something that was uh, that was interesting and informative and funny and had my personality in it. So I basically just chopped together this video, put it on YouTube. And then within a week, I think it got 20,000 views, which was like uh, the algorithm, my, the algorithm just picked it up. The algorithm picked it up because I didn't have an audience and I had maybe 3000 subscribers. So like, yeah, maybe it would have gotten 400 views, but then <laughs> it just took off in a way that I hadn't seen with any other video. And then that moment changed everything. And then I'm like, oh, okay, now I I get it. I'm starting to like see the matrix code that dates me to a little bit too, probably. But I'm starting to like see in between the lines. And I'm like, all right, this is the kind of content I should be making. It should be thoughtful. I should take my time to create it. And I shouldn't feel like I need to release three videos every week. So I just started out by doing one video a week, whether it was on minimalism, simple living, focusing on things that I was interested in talking about mostly talking about myself and experiences that I had had, why I became a minimalist, how to be in a relationship with somebody who isn't a minimalist. Yeah, and then that was a good one. To, that yeah, good yeah, one. That, was, that was certainly, uh, I think a lot of people resonate with that because uh, just ha- living with somebody who has a different lifestyle uh, certainly is, is not the easiest thing to navigate for people. But um, for us, we've made a channel. Like I released my minimalist apartment that started to grow. Mm-hmm. And that's when my, my audience, uh, and my YouTube that. channel started to take off. Yeah. So, uh, so you were still doing your podcast at that time. Uh, and, but you start seeing that this other content was taking off more and more. What, what have you learned about building an audience? You know, because you've built, well, first of all, there was a moment cause you were doing those videos and I was watching you, uh, cause I was a, I was as a subscriber of yours. So I was watching what you were doing and then there was a moment that there was an explosion. Like there was an mm-hmm. expo- like you're like all of a sudden I looked over and you're like, 
He's got a hundred thousand followers. Like, how did that happen? He's got two hundred thousand followers. Like, how did that? Ha- like, it, it. There was something that happened. What was that thing that happened that like just exploded you? Exploded your channel? Yeah, that was a really exciting a ta- time, especially looking back on it and yeah. seeing. Uh, it's almost like watching it from another perspective. Like, it wasn't happening to me; it was happening to somebody else. I, I basically um, had put out that one video, my minimalist apartment, and I started to make similar videos and they started to do pretty well. So mm-hmm. I had a streak of about a month where my channel was naturally growing. So maybe I like just natively through the algorithm, through people watching and subscribing, I think I grew to around 15,000 subscribers or so. And then I was featured as a creator on the rise. So YouTube picked me up in the algorithm. They saw that my channel was doing really well and growing quickly. And then when they put me on that homepage thing and featured me as a creator on the rise, which is like an amazing experience and surreal. You're like, wait a minute, they saw it. I guess they saw it. YouTube saw it. And then they just, they picked me. They probably have some way of sorting and figuring out like, okay, these channels are growing quickly. Let's check to make sure they're kosher. And like, they actually, it was, it would fit with putting them on the homepage uh, of the trending. So if you went to youtube.com slash trending, there's a whole category there. Uh, I made it there. And then probably in a day, I got like 15,000 subscribers, right? So it doubled in a day. And then each day after that, it was still like picking up. And then I probably in the course of that few months, like you said, got to about 100,000 subscribers. So it happened very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. And uh, that hap- that was a big moment. And that's like when a huge growth started. And then like, you have now a foundation to be able to build upon, which was, was exciting and knowing and like a little bit nerve wracking too, right? Because you're like, I'm uploading videos and now people are watching. It was easy when nobody <laughs> cared and like I wasn't expecting anything, but now I expect a lot of people to watch it. And so that was certainly a learning lesson and something that I, I had to grow into. And then there was actually another moment last October, so not even that long ago, in the past year, that my uh, I did four videos. I think I like had four or five videos uh go viral like hit over a million views back to back to back and one of them was a day in the life of a minimalist Mm -hmm. which currently has it's my most viewed video it has over 11 million views and like so so that all was crazy and i think i got 200,000 subscribers in a month just from that month alone and then uh from there like that's how it's been uh kind of snowballed into what it is today but you know it's it's uh it's awesome it's great I like I, originally my goal was to get 15,000 subscribers. I thought if I could get 15,000, I'm pretty sure I can make a living doing this. Uh, so everything else has been cake on top of it. It's been very cool to be a part of. And just, just I've just been blown away by how nice people have been in the YouTube comments that there's like really a community there of people who uh, are, are working on themselves and trying to learn and they're not being critical or judgmental. Of course, yeah, I got a few little negative Nancys in, in the comment section every once in a while. But for the most part, everybody's just been, been super awesome. And it's just been uh, it's been an amazing thing to be a part of and certainly something I'm proud of. And But the, th- the big tip there, I think, and, and people listening, thinking about trying to do something like this, is that you were hustling out content for a while before anything happened. So by the time that YouTube showed up, it wasn't that you had two videos up there. You had a lot of content up there. And they said, oh, wait a minute, there is a lot of content. So when people started to show up, they subscribed not off of one video, but they described because you had a a portfolio or a library of videos already created. Uh, but you weren't getting any money for those and you weren't getting any kind of views for those. But you just kind of just you just kept grinding until something popped. Yeah, and it was it was 10 years too to that point, right? Of doing freelance and working on films. And again, like not making any money. Uh, like I didn't make money in the beginning when I first started freelancing and that's not why I made videos to begin with. And I wasn't making money early on in YouTube, not why I did it. And you couldn't stop me. You couldn't stop me from making videos. Like I loved it. Like, right. that, you know what I mean? That would be torture to me. Uh, if somebody were to take away all my cameras and say that I can't make films anymore, it would be a struggle for me to figure out something else to do with my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was going to do that no matter what, whether, you know, of course there was always, the potential that it wasn't going to work out. And I think that's something that everybody needs to come to terms with. Uh, It may not, and it's certainly not going to turn out to be the life you'd imagined, or it's not going to happen the way you might expect it to happen, but you have to continually focus on what you love. So for me, like 
if I didn't make it as a YouTuber, I would have just done freelance again. And I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have felt like a failure. I would have mm-hmm. been so proud that I tried, that I actually made the attempt. And then if it didn't work in three, four years, whatever time we decided, hey, like, you know, we need to pay for the wedding or we, you know, we need to, um, you know, Natalie, we might get a house or we have kids and we have even more bills that we need to take care of. Um, I had that opportunity to go after it. And if it didn't work, that'd be fine. I'll do freelance and I'll still make videos. Maybe I'll take another stab at it again in the future. But, you know, you always have options. And I still always in the back of my mind, in the back pocket is like wedding films. I'm like, if everything falls apart and nobody ever watches a YouTube video of mine again, and I cannot get, build a freelance career again, I'll just start making you, I'll make wedding films and I would be totally fine to do that. And like, it's good money and uh, I could still make videos. So that to me, like just, it, it's almost like just a security wall for me that I just know, like I'm always going to be doing this no matter what, unless I go blind or something happens to me. Uh, knock on wood, <laughs> but uh, I think it, unless anything like that happens, I'm still going to continue to make videos. So. What I also find fascinating about your your meteoric rise, if you will, in the YouTube space is that money was not the main focus of what you were doing. I mean, it was to a certain you have to make money to survive, but you did not turn on advertising. You, you are, your model is very different than others. So can you talk a little bit about the business aspect of your YouTube channel? Yeah. So for the first, I mean, what, I guess a year and a half, two years, I did not turn on monetization. I did not do any sponsorships. And like, I certainly, I mean, it was, oh, I mean, at least half a million dollars yeah. I, I gave up by yeah. doing that, at yeah. least, at yeah, least. not a million. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, look, I'm thinking about it to myself. I'm like, what's, why? But, but I'd love yeah. to, that's why we're asking. Sure. Uh, well, in the beginning, it didn't matter because I wasn't, you know, I didn't get have any views in the beginning, so I had no incentive to turn it on. And I was more interested in making something popular, interesting, uh, valuable than I was about making money off of it because even when I just started to gain that traction in the beginning, I was like, I would rather, I would trade a view for a dollar. I'm not that I would, I'm not that I would buy views, but basically when you have advertising, you're going to lose a certain amount of people that are going to be clicking on the ads. That's just, that's what the advertisers pay for. So I was like, ah, forget it. Like, let me just actually focus on views and garden building an audience and building a community first. And then I'll figure out the money down the road. I did start Patreon, uh, last year, late last year, maybe around October or so, maybe over the summer. And that was my main way to, you know, raise money to do the, do what I do. I create additional videos and podcasts and all that stuff. Uh, and then I was able to make good money doing that. And then just recently I decided to finally turn on monetization and sponsorships to do a six month trial to see one, uh, does that hurt views? Does it do, how do I feel about that? Am I feeling good about the partnerships I'm making and the companies that I'm working with, do I feel like it just distracts and takes away from the video too much? Uh, and then can I use that money to invest back in my videos and make even better videos, maybe travel more and do more uh, films outside of the, my apartment and outside of Los Angeles, uh, and then invest more into maybe feature like documentaries. Maybe I can produce, a, whether it's a YouTube original or another Netflix film. Uh, there's a lot of awesome things that you can do with money. And yes. I don't... <laughs> need to buy a lot of stuff like i've got all this i literally have all this stuff i need uh besides like camera gear and film gear which is like you know continue it's a, always an investment Ever. every mm-hmm. years you need to um, continually make sure you have your cameras up to the right standards and because we love it and we want to make better films but so that's where i'm investing like all the money i make like obviously you got the 401k we got the wedding fund we've got uh like a, a fund to potentially buy a house in the future but for right now, it's just like I'm just trying to make the best films I can, and money certainly helps. That's awesome. Now, now I do want to talk a quick about one of your videos because it's something that's dear to my heart. You you took a cold shower for 30 days. Oh yeah, I did. Yeah, I've, that was fun. It was I, kind of it kind of sucked. <laughs> I I've been taking a cold shower now for uh, four months now, five months. Wow, How do I you like it. I love it. I love it. I actually actually when it's um. When the when the, uh, the 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 hot water accidentally gets turned on or something like that, I, I freak out. I don't like it. I don't like the hot water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't it like hot water anymore. Experience like taking a hot shower after that thirty days. Uh, but 
I do the cold showers wakes you up like nothing else, like no cup of coffee ever could. Yes. And it's like, it's just refreshing too. And now sometimes I'll like I don't take cold showers right now, like not religiously, but I will like end on a cold shower. Uh, I love doing cold plunges. Like I love jumping into the ocean. Like to me, nothing feels better than just like freezing cold water. I don't know what it is about it, but it definitely like it talk it changes your state in an instant. So oh. if you're like anxious or nervous or whatever if you hop into a cold shower it's gone like, you cannot think about anything else but like the pain you're experiencing but it's like a good pain right well, the, the, pain but, bad. but like the thing is this and i've told people about it i started doing it because of the hoff uh hoff mess the hoff method um the iceman the guy who does Wim Hof. yeah will hoff yeah, exactly and uh, i started studying his stuff and when i started taking that cold i started taking cold showers i realized that one every single thing that my mind was telling me to to why I should not get into the cold shower is the same excuses it told me about not making a feature film or not doing this because it was such a it was such a outside the box thing. Your brain's there, and I, I've said this a bunch of times on my podcast. Your brain is there; it doesn't care about your happiness. It doesn't give a crap about you getting to your dream or not. It only cares about survival. It only cares about itself. And a cold shower is not in that equation at first where it, it, you have to kind of break through that men, that mental block. And it, trust me, dude, that first month, man, you know, it was – I started the same way. I start off warm and then slowly cool it off. And now like I literally this morning I went to the shower and I, I put on like a little – like it's just a, a drop of hot water, just a drop, just so it's not mm -hmm. absolute freezing. But then as I'm walking, I'm like, mm, it's too hot. <laughs> I, take, yeah. I took it off alcohol all the way. You adapt to it too. And yeah. I think like you adapt both physically and mentally in terms of how you are prepared to take it. And uh, there's a great book that does talk about this, uh, the, the Flinch by Julian Smith. And mm -hmm. it's about uh, basically, you know, when you, if you're boxing and you're in a fight and somebody snaps their, their, their hand at you and snaps a jab at you, mm -hmm. if you flinch, you're not going to win that fight. So boxers over time develop this, no flinch mentality. So if somebody's going to take a swing at them, they have to always be there locked in. And if they close their eyes, then they're going to get clobbered. And that's what we do in life all the time. We're flinching at these big opportunities, these things that scare us. And instead we're deciding not to go on that date, not to make that film, not to take that cold shower. And a cold shower is one of those things that uh, it, it, there's no harm in it. You, unless you have like uh, problems with your heart, you're not going to have any the negative repercussions because of it. It's strictly uh, a, a, a personal thing. You're, you feel a little bit uncomfortable. And the more we can embrace those uncomfortable situations, the better we're going to be able to do that throughout the rest of our life. Yeah, and there's also health benefits too. And I remember I wasn't, sure. I wasn't as sore as I was when I work out because it's just – there's a reason why athletes take ice baths. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the cold plunge. Like That would be like a dream of mine. Have a cold plunge. Uh, in an ideal world to have a cold plunge at my house and then maybe a little sauna to be able to do the a cycle back and forth. That's what Tony uh, Robbins but, has. Tony Robbins has like this yeah. this dunk this dunk. Uh, but like he just has it's like yeah. a hole, it's like a hole in the ground. He just forty degrees or whatever. He drops in and then he jumps over into the sauna. I'm like oh, so good. Yeah. <laughs> People I know listening right now are watching. They're like these guys are crazy. These guys are nuts. They're I don't nuts. Know. I think you like you have to actually try it. And I would definitely recommend if you were just getting into it, maybe go to a spa or sauna that has it where you can do the sauna cold plunge because that's like – it's certainly an experience to be had <laughs> for sure. It's, it's definitely something you'll remember. I think it's more of a mental exercise than a physical one because it's all mental. Like your body can handle it. Your body, your body will tell you to stop about 20% before your body will snap. So it's just – it's just evolution. It's there to protect you, but your oh. body can handle a lot more than your mind thinks it can. And if you can break through that, it does help a lot on our filmmaking journey and our life journey, just being able to break through that uncomfortable state. Because what do we all always try to do? You know, avoid pain and, and go towards pleasure. And we're always trying to avoid pain, but the pain's kind of where the good stuff is. That's where the dreams are. Like, like Joseph Campbell said, the, the the treasure you seek is in the cave that you're afraid to walk into. Mm, I love it. Yeah. yeah, that's a Ryan Holiday has a book called "The Obstacle Is the Way." Yes, yes. Yeah, it's about stoicism and 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 how 
in our life, we're always trying to avoid obstacles. We think that they're they're getting in the way of our life when, in fact, they are life. And the sooner we understand that things will never go according to plan, the quicker we can find contentment in our lives. Have you do you, have you delved into stoicism a lot? You know, I just interviewed Ryan Holiday yesterday. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, he's awesome. It was really, really cool to connect with him. It was like surreal too, because I've just, I've read all his books and I've yeah. been a fan for a while now. But he, uh, yeah, so I've, and I'm starting to get more into stoicism. I mean, just the practice of it. A lot of people think it's like a lack of emotion, but that's not it at all. It's just about facing life's challenges mm -hmm. with a level head and not letting yourself like get an overinflated ego, continuing to, to be thankful for what we have. And uh, that, I certainly try to put that into practice myself. And you also interviewed um, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a god in the entrepreneurial space, Gary Vee. Yeah, How, yeah, what was, what was that like, dude? I have to ask you, man. What was it like talking to Gary, man? That was cool. So I actually had interviewed Gary once before, like a long time ago when I was doing freelance work, I, you know, happened to do an interview with him. So I'd been around him, but like that was before, I mean, he was big then, at least for people who were like in the circle and understood what he was doing and seen one or two of his books he had put out at the time. But obviously to this point now, his company has like exploded and he's, uh, he's almost a household name at this point. He's like very well known. But it was it was awesome. You know, I like I over prepared. I did as much as I could. I was very it was not easy to get the interview. I'm I, sure. I, I was coordinating with multiple people. I had some connections with, with friends who worked with Gary V. Uh, Tyler Babin, one of them, who was a filmmaker. And he's like, I can he's like, just write up an email and I can forward it to him. But he's like, you know, I can't guarantee anything. And then nothing really worked. And then all of a sudden I, I just sent out a tweet to him one Sunday night and was like, we'd love to interview you about how we can hustle with more intention, how we can bring more intentionality into our work lives um, and how to find happiness. And I think my subscribers might gain some value from that. And then I think he, he, then he just responded and just said in, and I was like, all right, sweet. Like when is this going to happen? And then it was maybe a couple months later, like we coordinated it. We had eventually scheduled an interview. Uh, he ended up coming, he was in LA and I happened to, have a you know 30 minute block with him where I got to talk about intentionality and minimalism and I prepared the hell out of it. I read every one of his books they're going into so it. And I probably yeah, they're so good. I probably over prepared, but like his books were certainly a good reminder to me. And like I really wanted to I didn't want to go in there and be like, yo, why do you hustle so hard, Gary? I wanted to understand like this man and and how he how he thinks and works. And when I read his books and I got the full context, I'm like, he's he's just wants people to be happy. And he thinks that working hard and, and you got the hat on right now, like hustling awesome. and, and putting in the work is an important aspect of that. And he himself would be miserable if he worked four hours a day or if he worked 40 hours a day. Like he would rather work 100 hours uh, or sorry, 44 hours a, a month, uh, sorry, a week. Yeah. So for him, it's more about uh, like I work a lot, but I love what I do. And if I worked any less, I would be miserable. And I think it's a, I think that's certainly an important question to ask ourselves. Like, are we happy with our work? Are we mm -hmm. working too hard? Are we not working enough? Uh, and where do we find that balance in life? And uh, I have to ask you, man, how is your uh, quest to get The Rock on the show? You know what? I still have a photo uh, in my wallet here. Like, I, I honestly, I walk around all day with a photo of The Rock in my wallet. And it's been in here. Like, you see it. Like, it's, it's like torn up. Yeah. It's like, that's, I have it on the camera up there. How did you get it's, that? Uh, what did you just like printed it out yourself? That's awesome. Yeah, I like went to like FedEx and then I just printed it out. And the guy was looking at me like, uh, this is like some weird shit, but I'm All okay right. with it if you are. And uh, <laughs> no, I, I decided from the beginning, like around a little bit earlier before you came on my podcast, I was like, if I could get one person, like what's the biggest name I could get? Somebody who's got the best ground up story, somebody who's made it, but still continues to put in the work and continues to bust his ass and work really hard and just seems like a great dude, somebody that I would like want to connect with and have beers with. And I was like, it's got to be The Rock. And I mean, he just continues to get bigger and bigger. And I think it becomes more and more unattainable, but it's fun for me. And like, if I never get The Rock on my podcast, if I never interview him, it's not going to be the end of the world. It's really just about the process, right? And enjoying the attempt. An attempt will be made. 
Uh, so we'll see if we can actually get him on the show. <laughs> yeah, I, I did. An, I literally just did an entire episode on a list of all the, f- the filmmakers and screenwriters and people I wanted on the show. I'm like, I just said, if anyone out there listening has any connection to any of these people, please reach out to me. And I'm just going to put it out into the universe and see, you know, and I had, you know, Cameron Spielberg, you know, all the, it's it just every big filmmaker, screenwriter, uh, and per, and, you know, personality that I wanted to talk to. And we'll see. We'll see. I've had actually have I've had it. You gotta go for it. Like that, Why not? I, I hate it when people are like, Oh, are you sure that person's kinda big? I don't think you're gonna be able to get them on the show or your podcast. And I'm like, exactly. It would be amazing if I could get them. And there is a world, there is an order of sequence of events that can conspire to make it happen. It just depends like how much do you want to work for it and how much do you want to put on the line to make it happen. And how many subscribers do you have now on YouTube as of this recording? Yeah. How many? 1.6. 1.6 million. So at 1.6 million, it's still hard to get The Rock on. But at like 6 or 7 million, will his PR people go, we should probably have, get him on this show. Like there's a, there's a breaking point, dude. Like because 1.6 million is no joke. <laughs> at least to get – you know what? That's the one thing that I have to think about because I might <laughs> – you know, who knows? I could get invited to one of these press junkets. And it's like, is that how I want it to mm. go down? Like, would I want it to be like, I don't yeah. want to be just one interview amongst a hundred in no, the same no. setting. No. It needs to be unique. And it, you know, there's certain Oprah. like Oprah, you want to do Oprah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It needs to be a story, right? Like I wanted, you know, I mean, now it's not much of a story because my podcast and my YouTube channel has grown because like in the beginning it would have been hilarious because it was just a no name guy. Like I, there's a guy <laughs> Like that's my, the website's get the rock on Matt's podcast. Just some guy named Matt who wants to get the rock on his podcast. So now like some of the air has been taken out of it, but still it is, uh, you know, it's about that journey from the beginning of a guy yeah. that, you know, had nothing trying to get the biggest superstar on the planet on his podcast. So I'm still going to push for it. I haven't, you know, talked about it too much on the YouTube channel lately. It's been a podcast thing, but, uh, you know, once I have some time to, to delve into it, I want to like put together a plan and make like one video or a series of videos where like that's the only thing I do and maybe enlist as many friends as I can to try to like stir up and get on his radar. Other YouTubers, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we'll see if, if it ends up happening. Uh, if it does, uh, it'll be really cool and I'm sure it, it, it'll be a nerve-wracking experience <laughs> to oh, be had. Dude, sure. I, 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 you know the funny thing is is that if he actually heard this, he would probably do it. You know what? Like, yeah, I've talked to Brian Bowen Smith, who's a celebrity photographer, and he's worked with The Rock a lot, and he calls him a friend, and he's like, you know, I, I guarantee, like, it's something that he would want to do. Like, he really is a good dude, and he, he wants to do everything he possibly can to, like, make people happy and uh, do all the interviews he could possibly do. Uh, it's just a matter of, like, will the timing work out, you know? I mean, I like, I don't even... I say no to interviews, <laughs> right? Like, and then I'm like, the rock is, he's the rock. So I, like, he, everybody asks him to interview him all the time. So the amount of no's that he gives out is exponential to even what I do. So I'm like, I feel bad when I say no to people. Cause I'm like, I'm sorry. Like right now I'm working on a film. It's just, I can't, I can't mm-hmm. do an interview right now. And it's like, I'm like, it's just me. Like, I don't see myself. I don't hold I myself do too, too. in high regard. I, I agree. <laughs> but, I agree with you. I get asked things all the, I get asked things all the time and I have to say no to, I've, I've learned to say no to them, but I do appreciate you saying yes to this interview though. I do appreciate it. Of course, I, man. Absolutely. I, I know you're, I know you're, I, I know you're big time now, so I do appreciate it. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. I do. So I mean, you, you helped me out so much when I got started. So. so what is the next thing for you, man? Like what is, what is in, you know, the next few years, man? Cause I've, again, I'm, I'm so, I'm, and I don't want to be uh, derogatory but I'm, I'm so proud of you i don't want to say uh, you know you. I, i'm proud of because i saw you literally fresh off the boat with like hey man i'm just hustling you know this podcast and i'm trying to get this little youtube channel off the ground to 1.6 million subscribers and you kind of blew up and i see all the work you put into it and it's a lot of work man you do a lot of work yeah. there's no question but what's the next what's the next steps like do you want to do more feature films do you because now you have an audience like if you decided to make minimalism too, which would kind of go against minimalism, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> you yeah. know, minimalism to the electric boogaloo. If you decide to go <laughs> down that road um, and you have a built in audience that way you could easily self distribute the film. You could, you know, probably finance the film yourself. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of film entrepreneurial things that you could do based on the audience that you've put together. You could create different contexts. You can create 
online courses on how to become a minimalist. There's so many different things that you can do. What is the next steps for you, man? Yeah, so first I would say that like I I have definitely pushed up to the point of burnout multiple times. And I know this is something that a lot of YouTubers and creators, entrepreneurs deal with. And I think that if you haven't pushed yourself that far, it's, it's a good test. It's good to know like the line and where we should be drawing it. Cole Wallister is, is the one that told me that. He's like, just push yourself across that line every once in a while, but then come back and then understand, okay, that's probably a little bit too much. I probably don't want to spend that much time working. So now I feel great. I mean, I, I've had some anxieties in the past and some burnout and all this stuff, but now I feel like I'm at a place in my life where balance is there. I'm really, I'm dedicating myself to my health and my wellness mm-hmm. and my life. And also creating the films that I want to make, and I'm not sacrificing on quality in any way. Uh, continue to make f- films is and always will be the goal uh, and, and what I plan to do. What form that takes, what platform that ends up on, I'm not really sure. We are working with Netflix on another film, uh, and it, it is like it's not minimalism v two, but it's like similar <laughs> story, Josh and Ryan's story, and we're kind of going into it uh, and telling it in a totally different way. So we are working on that film. I'm doing the YouTube videos. Once that film's complete, yeah, I think it would be really cool to do uh, an original documentary. Probably not. A, I don't know about a series. A series is too overwhelming unless like, there was work. funding for it. Right. But that said, like, uh, I think it would be fun to do an original project. Maybe something like my YouTube videos. Maybe like a, a film on self help and self development. I think could be really cool and fun. And I think I could basically just make. Uh, a longer format version of one of my YouTube videos. But uh, other than that, yeah, I mean, you you have to continually push yourself. And you got to mm-hmm. do things that you're uncertain of and unknown whether it's going to be uh, work out or not. And uh, that's what I'm most excited about is just embracing the unknown. That's awesome, dude, man. Again, I, I want to congratulate you, brother, on all your success. It couldn't happen to a nicer guy, man. Seriously, I, I, I I'm, you, I'm happy. I'm happy to see you. That you're doing well, man, and that you're doing good work, and you're being of service to the your community and to the world at large. For people, I mean, the the concept of minimalism is so important. I mean, it was because of you I threw away a bunch of shirts I was looking for six months later. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I, that. I'm not kidding you. I went through my whole closet and I started dumping and stuff and then i lost 40 pounds and then i'm like oh let me get that hawaiian shirt on I'm like oh i don't have it anymore i threw oh it God. away oh, i've been waiting yeah. for years to wear that damn thing there uh, are more hawaiian shirts out there <laughs> yeah, exactly that's the way i look at it i look at it that way but yep. i've tried to become more minimalist in my life and 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 it's helped me out a lot i'm not i'm not where you're at um, because I have children, and I would love to see your life with children. Uh, can't wait. <laughs> that's gonna be. I can't wait. It's uh, gonna change. Things will change for sure. <laughs> the minimal, the minimalist father is gonna be a very. That should be the next YouTube channel. The minimalist father. <laughs> That's really good. Yeah, when everything falls apart, it the, might be an oxymoron. The whole thing just comes crashing down around <laughs> you. Now, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests, sir. Uh, what advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Do it yourself. DIY, man. Like, Don't wait for people to tell you what to do or what camera to use. Don't let excuses get in your way. I don't have this lens, so I can't make this video. Uh, I don't give a shit. Use your iPhone. Use whatever camera you have. I started with a Sony Handycam, and that quality is like a potato today. So like, just just get out and start making it. If you really love the craft and you love what you do, uh, that's enough momentum to to build upon to Mm -hmm. make a career out of this. So just focus on that. Uh, Can you tell me the book that had the biggest impact on your life or career? Uh, the War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. What a it's great amazing, book! Amazing book. Oh. It just puts into words the struggles that I have faced and continue to face with my work and sitting down to do the work. So he's uh, he, he calls it the resistance. resistance. So it's this force that prevents you from sitting down to do the work that you need to, the creative pursuit that you're on. And uh, you know, just reread it recently, and it helps me every time I, I'm I'm have, facing a roadblock and I'm having difficulties actually getting to work. And I love his uh, the sequel, "Do the Work." Uh, which yeah, is a, it was uh, yeah, the War of Art and Do the Work. Yeah, both of them are fantastic. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Enjoy the process. You know, it's it, when you're working on your first feature doc or. You're working on the YouTube channel that you're hoping to build uh, into something that's successful. 
we have a tendency to continue to look forward, to look forward to the moment when we've made it, when we no longer have to worry about anything ever again. <laughs> right. As you find out, that moment never comes. And there's always new challenges and obstacles that will be had. And the more that you can enjoy the process, enjoy each day that you get to do the work that you love to do, uh, even if you're just getting started out and you're not making any money, um, then I think like that, that's where contentment lies. That's where we find happiness is in those moments. Without question, because if you keep going after that, if you live in the future, you will never enjoy the present. And it, it it's just like it's like that rat wheel. It's like that uh, hamster wheel. Yeah, very much. Now, what is the biggest fear you had to overcome when you know making your first film or launching this YouTube channel? What's that thing that you had to overcome to, to get where you are? Am I like worthy? Like, am I the one that should be telling this story? Am I smart mm. enough? Am I talented enough? Clever enough? Do Impo- I have something to offer? A lot of self doubt. Uh, Impo- imposter making films. Imposter syndrome. Yeah, you, completely, and it and it really doesn't go away. Like, I'm confident in my filmmaking skills, but in terms of like whether am I going to be able to deliver a really compelling story, or whether this film is going to be uh, what I set out to make is a whole nother story. And no matter what, like I talked about that from the very beginning is overcoming self doubt. It's one of the number one questions I asked my guests on my podcast, especially early on, because it was something that I dealt with firsthand. And the more you do it, the more you settle into it, the more you get comfortable. Uh, and, and just the more you embrace uncertainty because mm-hmm. you can let self doubt kill you and prevent you from doing anything or you can overcome it. Uh, and it's something that you need to do every day if you want to make great work. And the toughest question of all, three of your favorite films of all time. Oh, God. <laughs> That's so tough. <laughs> you know what's funny? is because like, I'm not even like a big film buff or – movie buff like surprisingly i know you are like you're like you're so into movies <laughs> and like it's your passion and i'm like i'm more into and as you are into making films but i spend more time thinking about and making my own films than watching too much but i'm uh, sure i'm sure you've seen three films that have touched you in one way shape or form in the last uh you know 30 odd years <laughs> yeah how about uh Bad Boys 2. It was a quality film. <laughs> nice. You know, like early on, it's like when you're a kid, it's like those movies define your life. Yes. Like, like loved Adam Sandler movies growing up. Happy and like, Gilmore. Yeah. They, yeah, like they're just the movies that you can go back to and you watch. And like, yeah, they're a little bit corny, but they make you feel really good. Uh, I'm trying to think of like some recent films that I've watched in terms of um, maybe, you know, like. One of the like documentary series is the Jinx on HBO. Mm. Like that, that's certainly, I think, such a well done series. And they used recreations in a way that I hadn't imagined before. Recreations back in the day used to be cliche and corny, and it mm-hmm. was like, oh, they look horrible. Oh, this is a dramatic reenactment. And instead, now it's like it's a whole new art form in film of how can we tell this story without having any footage of the events that happened. Um, so yeah, man, I don't think there's, that's, that's my answer. <laughs> bad, bad boys and some, and some Adam Sandler films. Okay. We'll take yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Look, man, I remember watching, I walked in the theater to watch bad boys one and I was like, my mind was blown when that came so out. So good, dude. The you know, I, you know, this is a great. cliche answer too, but like, uh, watching the matrix as a oh. high school student blew my mind. Yeah, like I remember my brother and I watching it late at night and like, I think we we rewatched it that night because it like blew our minds so much, uh, and certainly it was obviously a groundbreaking film in, in cinema. But yeah, like I enjoy movies, I love watching it, but I'm not, uh, you know, I don't I don't carry around a Rolodex in my head of favorite films. That would be uh, that would be me, sir. I, 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 yeah. I, yeah, exactly. uh, definitely. I admire you. I admire your memory <laughs> and your sharpness and, and how much movie knowledge you can pack into your brain. It's, there's, a, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of movies in there that shouldn't be in there. I wish I could just get rid of but, them. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> empty. You, you got to walk out of the movie. Delete, delete files, but unfortunately they're in there forever. Yeah. Now, where can people find you, your work, uh, and your personal home address? No, I'm joking. No. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, you can go to mattdevella.com, M-A-T-T-D-A-V-E-L-L-A.com. Mm-hmm. And like if you social, it's, it's all on there. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to find my YouTube channel and everything else from that website. 
Dude, man, thank you again so much for taking the time. I know you're a very busy man these days, so I thank you so much for coming on and sharing your experience with the Tribe Brothers. So thanks again, man. Thanks for having me, dude. This was a whole lot of fun. I want to thank Matt again for being on the show and doing the work that he's doing in spreading minimalism, filmmaking, and creativity to the world. We need more and more guys like Matt out there. So thank you, Matt, again so much for being on the show. I truly, truly appreciate it. If you want links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including links to Matt, some of his videos and uh, his channels and how to get a hold of him, please head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 368. And again, I want to thank you all so much for the support for the new book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur. It is, I'm again, so overwhelming for everybody that, uh, that's been buying it and talking about it and leaving reviews and messaging me and doing social media posts about it. Thank you guys so much. I'm so glad it's resonating with the tribe. And every day I keep seeing more and more books selling, more and more audiobooks going out there. And I, I, I really just want you to please... Uh, spread the word about what is in that book. Share it with as many filmmaking friends as you can. And if you have read the book, please take 10, 15 seconds, leave a review on Amazon or Audible for the book. It helps so much with the rankings of the book and the algorithm and all that kind of good stuff. And it gets to more and more and more filmmakers, which is what I want this book to do. I want it to spark that indie film revolution. Now, I did tell you guys that I was going to continue to do two episodes a week to the end of the year, but I might have to go back on that because I'm just too slammed for all the stuff I've got, I'm working on for 2020 for you guys. It is going to be the most insane year for the Indie Film Hustle Tribe without question. And I got a lot of stuff planned. So I might put out another episode this week. I might not. You will get one next week as well on Christmas week and one before. And then we're going to get into 2020. So I can't wait to share all the cool stuff that I got cooking for you guys in the new year. So thanks again for listening. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. Hey, how many people are you expecting? Relax. It's an open invite. I think you're a few seats short yeah like 14 seats you should enter your eligible new york lottery draw game tickets with collect and win you could win a five thousand dollar gift card to use at the home depot and buy a bigger table to host hopefully they also sell chairs the home depot is not a sponsor of this promotion you must be 18 years or older to purchase a lottery ticket you must be 21 or older to purchase a quick draw ticket where alcoholic beverages are served please play responsibly and by 1720 hey how many people are you expecting relax it's an open invite i think you're a few seats short yeah like 14 seats you should enter your eligible new york lottery draw game tickets with collect and win you could win a five thousand dollar gift card to use at the home depot and buy a bigger table to host hopefully they also sell chairs the home depot is not a sponsor of this promotion you must be 18 years or older to purchase a lottery ticket you must be 21 or older to purchase a quick draw ticket where alcoholic beverages are served please play responsibly and by 1720